Uh, I would like to start with Daniel, so you continue with the same mood, uh, asking you for the opportunities and challenges that the different stakeholders in your community face regarding the open source. You mean in Europe specifically? Yeah. Yeah, so I think on the one hand there are clearly challenges and opportunities that are European specific. You know, we have the CRA here and we have grants here that are European. On the other hand, I think it's really important to retain hope for global open source. And I think it would be really bad if uh, you know, our children lived in a world where there is European open source versus American versus Chinese open source, or even Austrian open source versus German open source. Hmm. So I think on the one hand, we have to uh, work within the, the reality of different countries and different jurisdictions. Um, we have to take advantage of the opportunities. We have to try and foster this. But at the same time, I would hope that we're also working to prevent you know, in more and more fragmentation in the open source space. To me, open source is something that fundamentally belongs to humankind and not to a country. Thank you. Someone want to add something else? No, I, I, think, I think you're totally right. And that, that we are, I, I, I tend to think that we are really at the change uh, of, uh, of an era where uh, globalization is, is, uh, has been driven my generation, at least my thinking about, you know, frontierless space where I could travel anywhere in the world. And I was lucky to be born in Italian, carrying a very powerful and easy passport. But it was, uh, the, the open source development was always about um, doesn't care where you come from, doesn't care which passport you are, doesn't care what you have studied, what degree you carry, as long as you have running code. Uh, you're going to be good. And um, this is changing now, and we need to be mindful of the challenges, but also I, I speak with my advocacy hat on. I think we should try to maintain that vision that uh, Daniel so correctly try, is trying to push of, of keeping barriers and geopolitical issues outside of our space. I think that those need to be handled at a different level. And I'd like to add, um, because you know, I re represent generative AI commons, obviously AI is represents opportunities everywhere. <laughs> and uh, I do think that while you know, a, a lot of uh, Gen AI uh, innovations started in Silicon Valley, you know, US, and while US and you know, even China, they're thinking about moving so fast, the European community is thinking about being responsible, right? Privacy and security, um, GDPR, you know, the European community came up with that as a leadership in, in that space. And I think that presents, you know, it, it, the privacy, security, obviously, big challenge. But I do think that it is also opportunity for the European community to, you know, help the rest of the world to remember building responsible AI is very important and privacy and security is very important. Um, I agree fully with all the statements, and I also a think. Boring panel. Uh, no, uh, just a moment, just a moment. There will be some mm -hmm. discussion. Um, nevertheless, in the ideal world, I think it should look like this. In the real world, I see after 20 years of political lobbying that all the countries are very different, and there are, um, at least in the political system, that the legal system and also the financial situation is very different. In the US, you have the United States, which is one government, at least from outside, I, I would say, <laughs> from the news, we see one president. <clears throat> but um, in Europe, we, we have the European Union, but at least Switzerland, we are not part of it, and others are more or less part of it, and there's a lot of, well, the, the, the least, the common denominator, denominator, I think, is the European Union. And so therefore, I think in Europe, we have more the challenge also to reflect the, rea the political reality of the national situation. Nevertheless, I think it's good to have summits like this, or the FOSTEM conference, or the Open Forum Europe, and other sit um, uh, events where we can connect and actually calibrate all these different um, advances. and. And that's where I see the chance, because when I hear from Netherlands um, how they are progressing, or the international situation, or the global situation with AI, or the company situation, I think that's 
the challenge or the, that's the, the opportunity where we can meet together and see what's going on in the other places and then bring success stories from the one side to the other side and tell the government and that's from my experience, governments listen to the success stories of others. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be the first movers, they don't want to be most innovative, usually in average, but if the, they don't want to be the la last ones. And so therefore, I think helps, it helps to have success stories from other countries, from the, from the industry, and from the global situation, so we can um, advance this. I, if I can add to that, I don't fully agree, um, <laughs> so it's going to be interesting. Uh, as a public administration, I, I agree if from somehow someone has to be the first one, so that's a, a challenge and it's sometimes in the Netherlands feels like a competition who's the first. Uh, that's actually okay, but uh, uh, being the first creates a little bit sort of uh, a politician um, idea around that, who, which kind of member states, which ministry is the first one to actually be working open. Uh, yes, you have, to, you have the European Union, but um, that's morally politics and less uh, technology driven, uh, actually uh, on an execution level. And we as a uh, Dutch tax administration are morally focused on how to do that, on what kind of technology do we need, where does the technology come from, is it Europe, is it America, is it uh, anywhere else. Um, yes, it's a common ground that's te that it's technology, but the politics is, is ca quite hard. That's, that's getting involved into the technology. Um, so we need to bridge a gap between the, the politics and the technology and we need, well, I created soil, maybe it should be neutral ground on, well, uh, Swiss ground, but uh, um, there should be some sort of neutral ground. Can be the UN, can be, well, uh, the Linux Foundation. That's something we need to work on. I agree that the, I think it makes most sense to have global organizations like the Linux Foundation. And I think it's, it's a great example. Um, Daniel just showed us how IT organizations or technical associations collaborate with global um, unilateral or multilateral organizations like the UNAM. I think everything has already been said. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Or I can just shout. Um, so, would you see, maybe it's a... Thank you very much. Um, would you imagine, and it's maybe a utopian idea, um, what is the role that open source um, place in maybe not having a uh, Linux Foundation Europe anymore, or just the world, Linux Foundation world, or how do governments are treating this into saying, hey, we're, we are world, actually, um, we should regulate for people, not for identity in uh, nations. Oh, maybe <laughs> the project I have just presented is funded by the EU, right? And if it's because the funding money is coming from the EU, if we donate or transfer those software projects now in the foundation, the foundation will be the holder of the trademark and other things. And um, I think it's quite natural that a construct like Linux Foundation EU is the right vehicle for such a project that is funded in the EU. Nevertheless, Open source, by definition, is global, right? It's a global phenomenon. SAP has its headquarter in Europe, but we are a global company. 80% of our employees are working outside of Europe for the company. So, um, from my point of view, it's just different triggers from digital different regions that put a spin on open source, but what the outcome is always global and it's inclusive. Everybody can contribute. That's the beauty about open source. But the trigger might be different. In the US, probably you have less public funding for open source projects. In Europe, we have a lot of small and medium enterprises. And for them, I think open source can play a huge role in leveling the playing fields that they can somehow start on a base of technology um, that is as good as the major corporations have it. Um, yeah, that's why, from my point of view, it, it makes sense to have a certain regional spin 
just because to cater to the needs of the different regions, but we all share the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to add to that too, especially in the AI space. You know, obviously there's some infrastructure technologies we all can share because we do want, you know, technology collaboration, sharing, and most important, um, interoperability. But at the same time, each region or each country has got its own characteristics, either from legal perspective or cultural perspective. And um, for example, large language models, right? And we're talking about language coverage. And um, you, we can't, the whole world, we can't just have one language. We need to support all these different languages, even dialects, because language represents culture. So if we miss a language, that means we are missing a culture of you know, the, the, uh, a group of people. So I do think that um, we, we also, you know, while we are you know, creating technologies for sharing interoperability, um, but from an application standpoint, we need to have some, uh, we need to think about the regional needs. You know, I think it's in my nature to see the glass half full. When I look at this glass, I see it half full. But in this case, I think there is a real danger that the glass is being emptied in front of our eyes. You know, think about Linux or think about the internet. The internet, you know, the web, the web started in just outside Geneva at CERN and basically the entire world adopted it and it was really it was a good idea it was developers coming together it was the brightest ideas winning out not in one country not in two countries not even in the European Union but around the world almost everywhere and I think there is a danger that we're moving backwards I think there is a danger that more and more, you know, countries are looking at AI for a region, and how can we be competitive, and how can we ensure that no one else gets the gets access to the same hardware and the same models and the same, you know, it's like Prometheus, and it's there is fire, but it's not for all of us. It's just fire for you, and then I create fire for me, and and so I think it is a fact that fragmentation is increasing. And whether we are globalists, whether we you know, want to see a different future for ourselves and even more so for our kids or not, this fragmentation is happening and it's happening right here. So I think we need to acknowledge that and we need to work against it. We need to think through what are the bad weather models and institutions we can create so that even if you and I disagree, we can still work together wherever we have shared interest. And I think the Linux Foundation is going to play a huge role in this, has to play a huge role in this, because Linux itself is also used around the world. And we don't want to have a flavor of Linux in this country versus that country. So, you know, I love your utopian vision, and I think we actually came from this utopia, and we have to work hard every day to ensure that we are not drifting away from it. Yeah. Mm, I'm not so, so sure, because... Um, Linux is, I think, a good example how diversity in the Linux environment is actually working quite well from at least my point of view. There's one kernel, but thousands of distributions. So there right. is a common ground where we can actually collaborate. And that's where I think the open source model of collaboration is also perfect in, in, in a way that it's voluntary. It's not forced top down, but it's actually bottom up. You collaborate, you contribute because you benefit, and so therefore I see the half half full, the glass half full, because, um, for example, in Germany the Zendis is now growing, and, and we had talked to them uh, recently in Switzerland. They actually initiated the Open Code DE platform, where they publish governmental over a thousand governmental open source projects are published, and there is Open Desk, uh, finally uh, open source. Um, office suite, which is a real, co a real competitor to the entire uh, Microsoft Office stack. And so therefore, all these things are new to Switzerland, so we try to collaborate with Germany on these technical things, and then we can benefit. So I think Let it's... Let me... Uh, uh, yeah, because I, I, I do have a share a lot of the thoughts that Daniel is saying. And because and, uh, the, the problem is not really different distributions of Linux. The problem that I see 
is that 25 developers from Germany are the only ones allowed to contribute to the Linux flavor in, distributed in Germany. And then five in, in Italy are only available. Uh, and and, and, and 6,500 in China are, are the only ones available to, to contribute to the Linux kernel, to the future Linux kernel. It's this partitioning of the people who can access to the, to the open source code uh, at some point uh, that can, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous future that unfortunately I see the draining and, and I see the signs that this might happen and it's a real threat that we need to prepare for. Do you mind if I say one thing on this? A little bit of an opinion. Um, just kind of addressing directly the question. Um, the way I see it, um, I don't know you guys, what do you think, but most mission-driven nonprofits, in my mind, the definition of success is you achieve that mission and you make yourself obsolete. <laughs> like the moment you are not needed anymore, that's probably the moment you have achieved that mission. Now, I think there's always going to need to be a place for the Linux Foundation, because at global level, or, or a similar organization, whatever it is, because you need, a, a, you know, half of the problem of computer science are solved by adding a level of indirection, and so you need a level of indirection. Um, but the reason why we launched Linux Foundation Europe was absolutely not to fragment the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely yeah. the opposite of what we're trying to do. In fact, we used to be sort of just a global organization, sure, based in America, um, but you know, with representation and support from across the world, uh, funding from kind of different regions, contributors evenly spread across the world. Um, we actually launched Linux Foundation Europe to reduce the frictions for regions to engage. Mm -hmm. But I would absolutely say that, yeah, if geopolitics and techno-nationalism wasn't a, such a pressing issue right now, yeah, I'd love to say, yeah, we don't need it. We, it should mm -hmm. be one foundation. It should be uh, right. uh, one. And so I think I'm absolutely aligned in vision. I want to make sure that people understand that it's not. <laughs> it's really the opposite of creating a European version and a and right. US version. It's just you know, you have to respond to the needs uh, of your user. Uh, right. Uh, and that's what we've heard. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. It's the local actions are still necessary, of course. <laughs> I think it's an interesting thought that um, NGOs actually, once they achieve their mission, they make themselves obsolete. However, the, I think that the, the IT and the digitalization is very dynamic. So, for example, the open source initiative, a couple of, like the last 20 years, let's say it very simple, you didn't have anything to do because um, the, standard, the standard for open source software was set. It was clear no one had to change or add anything. However, a few years ago, AI, had a very high hype, obviously, and then actually you took over the trend. And I, I was following your the conversations very closely, and I'm very um, are thankful that you are doing this very hard and political work to defining what is open source AI, what's not, and what's kind of levels. And I was very um, interested in your speech because then actually the. NGO, the OS, OCI, OSI has a new mission, basically to update the, or to actually create a new definition. Maybe one day there's a, there's a need to also update the open source definition, I don't know. But I think even if certain goals are met as an NGO, you can reach to the next goal. Well, you can uh, update your yeah. mission. Uh, our trick is to put into the mission education. We always <laughs> have to educate. There is always a need to educate. <laughs> You know, I think we're both in, in Switzerland, and I really like controversial panels, but I think we actually agree more than it might seem, because I love diversity, and I think having only one Linux distribution would not be a great thing. And, you know, I, I was born actually here in Austria. I live in, in Switzerland. Uh, we have 26 cantons in Switzerland, which is a really small country. I think there is a lot of good in that, uh, because, you know, there is competition between 26 cantons. 
but it's also important. And redundancy, a lot of redundancy. Types. But the, exactly, there's also <laughs> important. I mean, there's yeah. the Swiss word of Kantonligeist, and I think that's not always great. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just worried about silos. I don't want to live in a world where we're siloed. The fact that you can do something differently than me, I think that's a feature and not a bug. <laughs> but if countries are telling us that we should not be able to work together because of a geographical boundary or a regulatory boundary, I think that becomes really dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that we have to work to yes. avoid. Well, I think here the concept of digital sovereignty is interesting mm -hmm. because I think Peter mentioned digital autonomy. I, I prefer digital sovereignty because here we, we have control, we have own um, ownership However, with open source and other kinds of collaboration, we can still share the resources and don't have to invent the wheel in every country from, from scratch. Now we actually do have a controversy, and I'm sorry for taking a lot of time, but <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, you know, I think I lost my sovereignty when I had uh, the first friend in my life, because I'm not completely sovereign. And when I got married and when I had three kids, I lost more of my sovereignty. Um, being completely sovereign, I think, you know, there is of course the concept of legal sovereignty of a country, which we all want and I think we should defend. But being completely sovereign, I think, means completely alone. You know, it means that we are not depending on Samsung and Oppo and Apple hardware, and we, it means we don't depend on operating systems, and we are actually producing everything ourselves, which in my case for digital identity means we go back to a piece of paper with a QR code, because we do print paper and produce paper in Austria, and we can print on it, but we can't do anything on top in terms of, you know, we don't produce smartphones here, we don't produce yeah. mobile operating systems. I, you know, the, the idea of digital sovereignty sounds incredibly nice. And I think it's very easy to subscribe and say, yeah, you know, yeah, sure. You know, better to be sovereign than to depend. But I think the truth is, unless we want to go back to the digital stone age, we will depend on others. And the trick is to find ways to manage that dependency in a way where, you know, losing one of those friends doesn't kick us back. Mm -hmm. I agree. However, I think you mixed up the word sovereignty with autarchism. Autarchismus. This is actually the bad notion of complete loneliness. And sovereignty is a positive thing, because sovereignty actually means you use resources like the Linux kernel or other sources, but you can actually fork it in a case Linus Torvalds gets mad and, and doesn't accept any SAP or um, Microsoft contributions anymore. We have the option to fork it, and that's sovereignty because we have the full control. We depend on Linus Torvalds. We are happy that he does great work, but we are not um, dependent completely for his work. That's why I called it autonomy and not yeah. because I wanted. I think that that's the word that the new commission prefers to. Open autonomy. I wanted to express that. <laughs> I, you will always have dependencies, as you said, yeah. but the important point is you need choice. If you only have one choice for your dependency, then you have a problem. As long as you have choice, and open source is a strong contender in creating choice, I think dependencies are not a bad thing. You cannot do anything on your own, and we have a specialized world where people specialize in certain um, areas and that, that's the vision of work, right? And we don't want to reverse that and go back in history to the mid-ages or something mm -hmm. like that. Do we have any additional questions from the audience? We have time for one more. So um, what I liked about this open source first approach for the Swiss government, and I guess the question can go to the whole panel, there was this little exception in the article, which says like, Sir Party, yes, I understand this fully, that gets quite straightforward, and then it said security. And actually it was raised to the audience, the question for security. So I have one or two things in mind, which I make up with security, where I definitely know these are restrictions, but could this open the back door for those which are working on this saying suddenly everything becomes security? And therefore the question has two parts, like what do you see this security means 
where it could not be shared, and will someone misuse it for widening the scope of security? Yeah, so I, I fully agree this um, uh, exception wouldn't be necessary for the technical people here. I think no one really has a good, um, or I'm, I'm very excited if someone has a good ex um, explanation, but it was necessary in the political process to get this compromise, otherwise this whole by default yeah. will not element would have been kicked out. And I r rather accepted this little exception thing than actually not having this open by default at all. Uh, I think I, I can add a little bit based on the experience of the Italian laws, which have mandated adoption in procurement of open source software as a, as a first class citizen and constantly has been a battle. Um, you go to court. That's one, one thing that you, uh, you challenge or you, you define what, what does it mean. If a law is, late, is vague, you go to court. Um, you ask for interpretation, and, then, and that's what gets refined. So yes, that, I, I mean, I'm sure that you went through. I'm going through a similar role in, in a much smaller law, uh, which is this open source AI definition, where people keep on asking, keep on throwing like very, very <laughs> precise. They, they pretend, they hope, they wish that definitions or law regulations, they are very precise in engineering terms. You need to be specific. Well, not in laws. In general, you, you want to have a little bit of um, vagueness uh, that, you can, um, that you can play with, that you can have something that you don't have to review every six weeks because technology changes. But you, you ask courts, you ask for commissions, you ask for um, experts to refine and understand. And with time, things will get clearer. Yeah. That's why we have lawyers. Exactly. Well, <laughs> right. Yeah. Or standards bodies or other entities. Yeah, in our case, uh, security is involved. Uh, if you share your own code, then you need to be sure that it's, it doesn't have um, any big issues. Yes, there's a law about that. Um, that contradicts a little bit, like you want to be as open as possible. Uh, so there, there comes the challenge, and our security team was really involved in that. Um, actually working on open, so open sourcing the first project, they actually said there should be no uh, vulnerabilities in the project you're opening up. And I said to them, OK, well, <laughs> probably we'll never open up anything. Um, because one of the dependencies you're using probably has a vulnerability in it. So that was a big challenge in the beginning. Uh, now they reframed it. And they set a specific level on what kind of dependencies should have vulnerabilities. So the, to me, it feels like you should open up the discussion. Um, and yes, there's a little bit of space around the laws there. Uh, and you need to find the space in, in how to uh, interpret the law. Um, but the second thing that came up was a privacy issue around our employees. Uh, our colleagues, they do commits with a specific account with which you can find back to the specific organization. So that's something we needed to work on. Uh, you, and you need to focus around that, what's, what's OK, and what's allowed to. So uh, yes, security is involved. Yes, security wants to have a final stamp. That's exactly what they're doing in our case. So I, I provided them a space to do that. Um, but it shouldn't be something you're building code, and it shouldn't be something that you're not allowed to open up. So yeah, there should be a healthy discussion around that and not pulling the security card that's not allowed to do that. No, start a discussion around that, make uh, proper regulations on that, and uh, in our case, it's working. There's a law, yeah, sure, but how to interpret that and how to actually do that? No, I agree to you that maybe this was more like a concession to the decision makers, right? And yeah. Yeah. to me, it sounds like the old concept of security by obscurity, yeah. but nowadays I would rather, rather uh, advocate for a security by design, and then it, stood, it should stand the test of peer review of open source review, and then you can be sure if, if it was reviewed by enough people that it's secure than your security by obscurity. Yeah, but you need to work on that. So it, in our case, it's also security by design, but you need to work on that how to get there. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, based on what you're doing for 20 years already, uh, that's a big change. So you can talk about security by design, but how to actually do that by design. 
um, and how to educate the people to do that in the correct way. That's one of the biggest challenges, I believe. But, but here I see also the big opportunity in a way that we have now a good discussion about security. That we discuss now what is exactly security by design. We open up, there is an open collaboration on algorithms and, and, and cryptography and things. And so therefore it makes software quality better. Obviously that's why we're here. Okay, thank you. We are running out of time and I'm pretty sure you're starting to, to get uh, hungry. So I want to thank you all of you for joining us today. And of course, thank you to our panelists for this great conversation and discussion. If you have additional questions or you, were, you want to contact with any of them, reach out, out please. And uh, we we'll see in a bit. Yeah. Are you ready to <laughs> Maybe he's going to talk, but he's not enjoying your class. <laughs> Before lunch. Yeah, I'm just going to be brief about another 30, 45 minutes of me <laughs> talking. You guys are hungry? Oh. Uh, no, I thought, sorry. I just wanted to say I, I, I hope you found this morning inspiring. I certainly did. I don't often get to actually listen and sit. And, and really intake uh, a conference and I yeah I think we've heard private companies public companies we've heard Daniel bring it all together we've heard uh, from Annie and Stefano on, on really how um, we're making an impact globally so the, the latter part of the day is going to be a bit more uh, operational and, and, and maybe dry a little bit, uh, I would say, but uh, I hope you're, you're leaving with some inspiration to have some great conversations at lunch. And I really want to thank you all to be up here. It's, it's a star panel. So uh, thank you so much for all you do for us. Thank you.